In our last video, we learned that we could use recursion, where we define a method or a function if you're working in a language that isn't object-oriented, where we define a method in terms of itself. Um, and we could use this idea of defining something in terms of itself uh, to achieve looping behavior, and actually, therefore, as, a, as an alternative to using a for loop or a while loop in a programming language, anything that we could use a for loop or a while loop for, we can actually simply write a method that calls itself to achieve that looping behavior, and likewise, anything we can write where a method calls itself, we can achieve the same looping behavior with a for or while loop. So let's, uh, let's take a look at that method that we wrote earlier. We wrote a method called, uh, I think we eventually called it move to wall, and its job was to move the robot to a wall. And the way we did that is that we wrote that if the front was clear, then it was safe to move. So we moved. And then rather than writing a loop to repeatedly move as long as the front is clear, we simply said, having moved, the work that remains is now to move to the wall. And that's a reasonable thing to do because we've already taken a step so we're closer to the wall, so we've made some progress, now it's safe to move to the wall. Uh, and moving to the wall, we'll then check if it's clear, move again, then move to the wall, and so on. And we saw that actually run, and I want to take a look now and convince ourselves that, that it makes sense that it runs, that it does. Um, and I'm going to fill out that in the else case, we don't do anything at all. So first, some terminology. This, uh, every, every recursive method has a test. Why does it have a test? It's got, um, always has an if because there's always at least two cases. The case where the program makes a recursive call. Here's our recursive call. Recursive call. And because that particular case has a recursive call, we can call it the recursive case. And then we always have at least one case, and it was hidden before, but you could tell that there was a, a situation where it didn't move to the wall when the front was no longer clear and that case is called the base case. Um, often it turns out we write, we test for the base case condition first, and then the else is the recursive case, but you, it doesn't really matter which order we test it, as long as we have a recursive case that consists that includes a recursive call, and we have a base case which does not. So the base case is where the looping behavior, so the recursion stops in this case because there's no recursive call. Okay. So we're going to see that in every recursive method we write. Let's see what this one actually does. So move to the wall. And I find the easiest way to figure out what it's going to do is to make a little chart. So let's make a chart of all the different situations the robot could be in. So uh, situation and behavior, what the method does. So one possible situation is robot uh, is at the wall. It's already at the wall. The front is not clear. And if the front is not clear, I right, look at this code, it says if the front is clear, I'm going to do this, but the front isn't clear, so I will do nothing. So the behavior here is this will do nothing. Okay, so we can convince ourselves that when the robot's at the wall, this code really does nothing. So we're going to remember that. When the robot does, is at the wall, this code does nothing. Let's explore the next situation. Suppose that the robot's not at the wall robot is one square from the wall. In fact, let's draw a picture of that. Here's the robot. Uh, I'm drawing mine facing east. I know my demo previously was facing to the north. It was facing up on the page. So here's the robot. Here's an empty square. And then here's a wall over here that the robot can't get past. So in that situation, what does the code do? Well, let's take a look if the front is clear. Is the front clear? Yes, yes, the front is clear. There's nothing in front of the robot. So we move. So the robot will move over here. And having moved, we then move to wall. Now we don't have to think about the recursion here because we know what move to wall does. Because in this situation, the front is not clear. The robot's already at the wall. So what is move to wall going to do? Well, let's see, I wrote it down. The situation is that the robot is at the wall, therefore I already know that the behavior will be to do nothing. So it's as if this recursive call in that situation simply said do nothing, 
because the robot was already at the wall, in which case this simply says, the front is clear, move one step, we did, and then do nothing because you're at the wall. So we can convince ourselves this moves one, one step, one square. Let's try one more. Suppose the robot is two from the wall, two squares from the wall, and I guess we better draw a picture of that. So this time the robot is a little further from the wall. Robot's here, the wall is over here. So the robot would have to take two steps to get to the wall, and we're going to see what it actually does in this situation. Well, is the front clear? Yes, yes, this square is empty. So my code tells me to move, so the robot will move. So this robot moves into this square, and then we call move to wall. And I don't have to think about what move to wall does because I already wrote it down. Let's see, move to wall, in the situation where the robot is now one square from the wall, robot is one square from the wall, then I know that move to wall will move one step. So I know that the result of the original call when, I, when the robot was here is the front is clear, so we'll move, and then we'll move to wall, which in that situation moves one step, and so my robot will end up here. In other words, it will move two steps, and it looks like I can claim that this robot really is moving to the wall no matter how many steps away it is. Um, in actuality, what we just did is sort of a, a kind of inductive proof, um, a sort of convincing ourselves, uh, less of a proof, I suppose, than a convincing ourselves, but kind of a, a simple inductive proof that this recursion is working. Let's explore another method. Uh-oh. Oh, I know. Sorry about that. Okay, here's a method. D. If the front is clear, my robot moves, then it calls D again, so it's recursive, and stores the result in a variable called N, that's confusing, then backs up, uh, which means the robot's going to take it one step backwards, and then returns one more than N. And if the front was not clear, it returns zero, and I want to know what this program does. So let's make a chart. So, situation and behavior. What's this, what are the possible situations? Well, the simplest situation, I should always consider the simplest case first. Here, the simplest case, clearly this code is easiest to understand if the front is not clear, because I know what the front, what it does when the front isn't clear. It returns zero. So, uh, if the situation is not clear, oh, let's change colors for that. If the situation is that the front is not clear, then the behavior will be returns zero. Okay? So, if it's not clear, we return zero. We don't know why. Let's keep going. Now suppose that the uh, front is clear. So, it looks like the front is clear. We're going to move. So, maybe the next simplest situation, other than the front not being clear, is that we're one step from a wall. The robot is one step away from a wall. So, if we look at the drawing we had earlier, that looks like this. So the robot is here, the space in front is empty, and then there's a wall. So we're one step from the wall. When we're one step from the wall, this says, the front is clear. Okay, the front is clear. So we move. So the robot is going to take one step forward. That means it's now at the wall. Then we call D. What does D do when the robot is at the wall? Well, it won't be clear, so it returns zero. So we know that this will give us back zero. That means n becomes zero. So n is now zero. Then the robot backs up. Well, if it backs up, it's in the exact same position it started in. So in other words, the robot really ha hasn't made any net movement. It moved, we called d, it backed up, it's back where it started, and we turn n, return n plus one. What is n? Well, n was zero, because that's what d gave us when the robot was at the wall. So n plus one is zero plus one, which is one. It returns one. And no net movement because the robot uh -oh, the robot is still exactly where it started having moved once and then backed up once we'll try this one more time and see what happens suppose that it, the robot is two steps from the wall what does this program do and maybe you've figured out what it does now well if the front is clear well the front is clear for two steps from the wall right in fact let's draw that out here's the robot, 
and there's two empty spaces in front of it, and then we have a wall. So the front is clear, so we move. So this robot moves here. Then we call D, and D is this method, and the situation is that the robot is one from the wall, so I look up in my chart, the situation when I'm one step from the wall, I know this method returns one and has no net movement. So whatever D does, the robot will still be in this position at the end of calling D, and I will get back the answer one. So one gets returned. So this will be as if it said one. That means N is one. The robot will back up. Well, the robot's here. If it backs up, it'll be back where it started. In fact, facing its original direction, assuming that's what backs, backup does. And then it returns N plus one. N is one, so one plus one is two. And it turns out if you, you probably see where this is going now. In general, D, and there's a reason I call it D, D returns the distance to the wall, the distance the robot is to the wall. The robot is measuring the distance to the wall. And just for fun, let's see that happen. Here's D. And we will load up our little world. Uh oh, oh, sorry. Robot load. All.txt. Okay. I'll show you that. There's my robot. Uh, we'll take a couple steps just for fun first. Now, how far is the robot from the edge? It's one, two, three, four, five, six. So if we say in the recursion file, call the D method, I should get back, if this code is really what we just analyzed and it is, I should get back six. Let's see if it works. Not only that, the robot should end up back where it was. Six, and it works. We'll do some more tracing in the next video. I'll see you there.